<laughs> well, good, happy Sunday morning, everyone. We're thankful that you're with us today. Um, Billy is in a very wonderful place. Uh, he's He went to a worship service with his some of his family, and he's parked in front of their church because yeah. uh, and he's in his car. You can see that he's in his car and he's on his hotspot phone, which I, I right. kind of I've heard of those things before. I'm not sure I could tell you how to do them. Most of you, I'm pretty, pretty backward when it comes to this kind of stuff. But anyway, right. I'm thankful for Billy going to his car and figuring out how to get us here today. And so thank you so much, Billy, for helping us to get to this place. So thanks. <laughs> Is it you said planes are flying over and good things are happening, huh? It's. Yeah, it's Bal Balboa Park in San Diego. They're meet in San Diego. They can meet outside, so they're oh. meeting at a park. Oh, cool! And, you know, it's beautiful. That's awesome. Well, good for you. I'm glad. I'm glad you're there with them, uh, and uh, and I'm glad you're enjoying worship with them. That's awesome. Or you did. And thank you for coming to do this. Uh, talk about worship at eleven o'clock. Uh, Brian is communicated already with me and Billy, and he's going to be putting up a worship set at eleven so that it doesn't mm -hmm. conflict with what we're doing because we don't know what time we're going to be on or off here. Could be way sooner than that or not. Who knows? Wherever the Holy, Holy Spirit leads us today. But we have a few minutes to talk about the word. Also, because this is Sunday, we want to put up the information about giving and um Again, uh, we talk about this almost every week that we get together, but giving for the church is, and for Christians is, a time to recommit your life to Christ. I hope that you take that seriously. I hope that you'll say, Lord, here's my life. Uh, I need some help. <laughs> some of us are in that place. I'm in that place. Lord, here's my life. I need help. I'm, I just, you know, I, I think I'm probably the mess, most messed up guy on the planet. I really do. So you don't, you don't have to believe that, but I, that's what I do. And so Lord, here I am. I just give you my life. I give you all of me. Thank you for accepting me. <laughs> Thank you for your grace and your mercy and for helping me to deal with, with life and helping me to deal with my relationship with you. And here I am, all of me, and I offer myself back to you. That's what an offering is. And that, and that, that pledge that you give financially is, is, is just a token that says, or a representation that says, this is what I'm doing. I'm giving you my commitment. I'm giving you back my life. And more than ever, in, uh, in our time, in our, in our history, and more than ever, in any time in my life anyway, and I'm an old geezer, so more than ever, uh, mm -hmm. I think it's important for us to make sure that we really understand who we are in Christ. Um, the world is a really, really different place today, and it's a really scary place for a lot of people, um, and it's a, it's a hard place for people to be. If you don't know Christ, it's even more difficult. And there are all kinds of philosophies out there trying to pull you away from knowing Christ the way you should. And so my hope for us today as a church is that as we read the 16th chapter of Matthew, and as we get into it, you'll see that God is moving us into a, a place to really understand who he is. And the way that we can do that is extremely easy, but it's hard to follow sometimes. So we're going to talk about that today as we get into this part of the work. Um, anything that you want to pray for Billy today? Anything on your heart? Um, well, Deanna, um, contacted us this morning, oh. Luann, oh. and said that she had three tough days oh. and that her levels, I, you know, I don't understand oxygen level, but I guess 78 or 80 is bad. Yeah, it's supposed to be a hundred. Well, anywhere, well, anywhere, anywhere between 95 and hundred is probably good. So she's 80. She dropped to 78. Oh, yeah. That's bad. Um, she thinks she and her mother, they think it's the weather outside that's affecting them. But she woke up this morning um, feeling better. Oh. That's the praise. Oh, good. And also she's put on Facebook, you know, she still wants to, there's 20 families, uh, children's families that she wants to reach out to for back to school. And she's had people from Stanford giving money. And she's, the great blessing is people, uh, people are pouring out, uh, incur, you know, money and encouragement and all that. So, so that from her from her bed, she's able to still run the ministry. Yeah, so that's good. That's cool. So yeah, De yeah, Deanna, I would say is, uh, and then the news about um, you know Harry and Cindy. Cindy uh, went to the hospital. She uh, negative. Oh, she's she's negative for COVID. So Cindy Franklin does not have it. Well, so that's that's place. good. I didn't know that. I was I've been praying for her. Yeah. So that's good. I I was yeah. I'm glad to hear that. So she just has the flu or something. Then not feeling well. Yes, and she's so highly compromised. Yeah. You know. Right. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, that's true. Okay. Well, that's, that's a praise. That's a great praise. Um, yeah. And I don't see anything here so far. Yeah. So yeah, that, that would be the things I've heard this morning that Luann and I have been praying okay. about. It's awesome to have Billy in connection with all those people so that we can spend some time in prayer for them and thanking the Lord for the good things. If you have a prayer request that you would like us to uh, express this morning, or even if it's unspoken, please put it up there on the on the bar. I can't read it, but Billy can from where he is. I, I only get I only get probably down to ten people, then mine stops. I don't know why. Then it stops. Yeah. Man, mine keeps. And also, I'll be I'm going to go away and hide, yeah. but I can pray. Yeah. You won't even hear yeah. me. And I, I just tell them that the guy who's uh, teaching today is in Matthew, right where Rick oh. was, <laughs> I don't know how long ago, Matthew 5, yeah. uh, the Beatitudes, um, about adultery and stuff. So I've, I kind of got a repeat on that, you know, <laughs> uh, same, mes same message, but just out of a different, you know, we're all, what amazed me today is that how many of God's people worship on Sunday yeah. all across the world. Isn't that yeah. amazing? Yeah, yeah. I mean, people that really love the Lord want to be with the Lord. And, and that, that is for sure, whether it's online or in person or whatever, however, whatever means we have to worship together is, is amazing. There are millions and millions and millions of people. And, and that's, that's what I want to want to share. I've shared this before, but that's a good reminder for us. Um, you know, there's mega churches. There are some mega churches with lots of people going to them, you know, tens of thousands of people going to these churches, big churches. And, and they're, they're not just a few of them. They, you know, there's, there's quite a few of them. And, but there are a lot of little tiny small churches from 10 people to a hundred people across this nation. In fact, the average size of a church in the United States is about 73. I believe that's the last number I read. So it's not very mm -hmm. big. The average size of a church is not, not bigger than, than a hundred even. And if you think about how many millions of people, <laughs> how many millions of people come together every Sunday, and we're talking millions and millions and millions of people come together every Sunday and worship the Lord from those little tiny churches. It's because, it's because God's name is absolutely alive and powerful with authority to do great things. And we're going to talk about one of those things today. Someone called me and asked me to, asked me to, told me a story and told me I could share it. Uh, and I want to share that because it goes along with our message. So listen, God is still at work today. Don't, don't think he's not, no matter if your heart, if your heart, if your life is hard, or if your if things are going simple or easy for you right now, no matter what is difficult or what is, what is very peaceful in your life, God is still at work and don't give up. Don't give up in the middle of the, in the, of the, the trouble. You know, God's God is allowing things to be stirred in your life if they are for a reason. And it's it, and when you have an attitude that says, God, I want to discover this reason, <laughs> then good things happen. Then yeah. wonderful things take place. So I just I just want you to know that it's it's a wonderful thing to be able to be in the middle of life itself. And no matter if it's good or not so good at this moment. But it's a wonderful thing to be in the middle of life itself and watch God act on your behalf because he will. Our job is to trust him to act. His job is to act. And, and it's a wonderful thing when that takes place. And we're going to see that part of that, that whole that conversation is always throughout all scripture. We'll see some of that today in the 16th chapter of Matthew and what happens here. So, Billy, you want to lead us in prayer? And then after after we pray together, Billy's going to put me on and I'm going to do a teaching like we do on Sunday mornings and then Billy will come back and we'll, we'll pray again and, and say goodbye and wait for Brian to come at 11. So yeah, you want to pray for us today, Billy? Sure. And I've got some prayer requests. Oh, well. good, those. Good. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we do lift up uh, Deanna and Virginia and thank you that they're feeling better today. I do thank you for the, for the outpouring of people who are interested in the, her ministry. That's a praise. I thank you for Cindy Franklin uh, that whatever she had, it's not, it's not COVID. Uh, I want to lift up Darrell Jr.'s request uh, for those who are out of work, um, whoever they are, Lord, and, and many, many are. I know in particular someone who I'm dealing with uh, for unemployment. Um, so we pray for that. This is the worst economy, I think, that, you know, in the history of our country, as what, from what I'm reading. And for Elia, her um, sister, Paola, is very sick. And I'm, I, I don't know what very sick means, but I pray for... Uh, Paola, and I do pray for Elia and Tracy, who are, you know, related, and um, 
that, that you would give them peace over that, Lord, because there's not much anyone else can do right now. We can't visit people. We can't even hug mm. them. But we can pray, and prayer is very powerful, especially in this time. So um, you know, I pray for our nation. Um, I was struck today. I don't go to other churches, obviously. But for me to sit in the park, Balboa Park, and see people worshiping you, uh, and it just reminds me of many, many people I don't know about. And uh, it's very, very encouraging that, uh, that on Sunday in particular, Lord, you've set that day apart. People come together to worship you all across this nation, all across the world. It's Sunday, and that's what they're doing. And so I thank you for that. I thank you for opening my eyes to that. And I pray for uh, Rick this morning that, you know, it's, it's Sunday and he's here to worship with us uh, and for Brian. And I just pray as Rick uh, goes through 21 verses, uh, these 21 verses, Lord, that you would um, you would speak through him, that you, in their, your words, Jesus, and uh, you would um, remind us of who you are and what uh, what's important. And uh, we just lift up this time to you in Jesus name. Yes. Amen. Thank you. All right. Well, we're going to go to the 16th chapter. Thank you, Billy, for hanging out with us today. Um, let me see if I can figure out what's going on with my little tablet. And well, there we go. Okay. Um, I had to turn this on again. Sorry. Uh, we're going to the 16th chapter of Matthew. Oh, Billy's gone. <laughs> I looked down and he disappeared. <laughs> I know he can hear us, though. Thank you again, Billy, for all you're doing today to, to help us to do this. Um, the first, the first two, ver the first two words in this 16th chapter, first verse, are two words that we need to talk about. I know we always say that, but we really do. It says the Pharisees and Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. Well, I think it's really, really interesting because the Sadducees and Pharisees didn't come together for much. Uh, they had different political views. They had different, uh, different views about angels about the resurrection. The Pharisees believed in both of those. The Sadducees did not. Um, the Sadducees were people who were an upper echelons, the up and the upper echelons of society. And they worked with the Roman government so that they could keep their position. The Pharisees just didn't just just tolerated the Roman government so that they could they could just be left alone to worship God the way they thought they wanted to. And so the, all of this, all of these things just put a, a wedge between, a, a chasm between the Sadducees and Pharisees. And these Sadducees and Pharisees, though, came together because they had a common enemy, and that common en enemy was Jesus. And so they came together, and they and their coming together wasn't so that they could build up Jesus at all because he was the enemy again. And so they wanted to test him. And it says here, it says, the Sadducees and Phar the Pharisees came and tested him that he would show them a sign from heaven. Now, when you when you first read this, it it kind of it kind of stands out because the first thing that I think of is, well, wait a minute, these these Sadducees and Pharisees have been following Jesus this whole time. They've been following Jesus since the in the book of Matthew. They've been and we're in the 16th chapter. We started in chapter five, and they've been following Jesus because he spoke the Sermon on the Mount, and he they've watched all these things happen. They've watched. They watched the leper be healed. They watched the thousands of, of demons be cast out of, of uh, the demoniac and, and thrown into pigs, and the pigs ran into the sea. They've watched people come alive that were dead. They've watched the deaf be, be healed. They watched the blind see. They, they, watched, they just watched all of these things happen. And so when you, when you first read, if you don't know something about the Pharisees and Sadducees and the time they lived and what they thought, when you first read this, you're thinking, I don't understand. They, they must have heard about or might maybe even have been a part of the 5,000 being fed and the 4,000 being fed and the basketfuls of food basketfuls of food being left after that. So they must have seen all of this. And now they're coming to Jesus and they're trying to test him. And they're trying to test him by saying, show us a sign from heaven. Well, lots of us would say, well, those signs are from heaven. But you have to understand the Sadducees and Pharisees of this day. The sign of heaven was a sign that was literally from heaven. And what they believed was that, in, in fact, you can see this in what they said to Jesus. Remember, the Pharisees said, well, you're doing all these things by the power of Beelzebub, by the power of Satan. Remember, they said that. So what they believed is that all miracles that happened on earth could be counterfeited. And I believe that same thing, by the way, but they could have be counterfeited. And so that Satan could be doing those. And so they wanted a sign not on earth like 
raising the dead or healing the blind or healing those who can't hear or can't speak or, you know, or casting out deep. Those are all signs on earth. What they wanted was a sign from heaven. So when we begin to look at that a little closer, it begins to make more sense to us. So he wanted a sign from heaven. And he, and he was upset with that. Now, what would be a sign from heaven? Well, a sign from heaven would be like, uh, like you know, mm, let's see. Uh, in the Old Testament, there was a sign from heaven. You remember the sign from heaven? When uh, the Baal worshipers were trying to, to uh, see if Baal would come and, and, um, and start their offering on fire and burn their offering up. And they prayed and it didn't work. And then God's prophet showed up and he said, I pour water on this offer on the offering. And, and then he prayed for a sign from heaven. And what happened? Fire came out from heaven and consumed the entire thing and the offering of that they had to bail consumed all of the offering. So that was a sign from heaven, like fire from heaven. So maybe that's what they're looking for because they knew those stories, those Old Testament stories. So maybe they're looking for um, these fireballs to come out of heaven and maybe destroy a Roman a regiment or something, you know, so that because what they wanted was they wanted, the, at least the Pharisees wanted, they wanted the Roman government to be overthrown. The Sadducees didn't really care about that that much, but the Pharisees wanted the Roman government to be overthrown. And so they were looking for a sign from heaven to come down and do something political that was impossible. And, the, and it had to be like a, a fireball or, you know, a fire coming from heaven and consuming whatever. And that's what they were looking for. And so this is Jesus's response to them. He said, he answered and said to them, uh, when it is evening, you say, now I think this is interesting because he talks about evening and morning and he uses the same conversation. Watch this. When it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather for the sky is red. Okay. So if the sky is red, it's going to be fair weather tomorrow. Uh, in the morning, it will be foul weather today for the sky is red and threatening. So he says, you hypocrites, he says, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. So what Jesus is saying to them, and he's saying to us, I think, is that, is that he's already given us all the signs that he's going to give us. And, and we can ask him to do things in our life. And they asked him to do something that was a sign from heaven. And he said, listen, a wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign and no sign will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he left them and departed. So that's a very interesting conversation. Again, these people, the Pharisees were not a political party. These people were not political. Um, and were and they were prepared to live under any government that would just leave them alone and just let them be so they could worship God. The, the Sadducees worked with these, uh, these governments so that they could be a part of the aristocratic conversation of their day. So they both wanted Jesus to send this sign from heaven. And when, they doesn't, when that doesn't happen, Jesus says, listen, I could send you all the signs in the world. But if you don't believe in who I am, then we have a problem. So this whole, this, whole, this whole chapter 16, Matthew 16, is a chapter that's going to speak about who Jesus is. Everything that happens from here on out is started with this conversation about signs from heaven. Now watch, let me read it to you again. Uh, if, you go, um, if you go to verse 2, when evening comes, you say, it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning today, it will be stormy for the sky is red and overcast. And you know how to interpret the presence of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation looks for miraculous signs, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. Jesus then left. Now, if you go back to, to chapter 12, you can see that Jesus already talked to them about this Jonah conversation. And in the Jonah conversation, he told them, look, there are some similarities between what's going to happen to me and what happened to Jonah. And if you look at what, what happened in Jonah's day, things, things, people repented, things happened. And that's going to happen today. But you have to, you'd have to believe 
that Jonah was swallowed by a fish. You'd have to believe that Jonah stayed there for th three days. You'd have to believe that he came on the, the land and was, was thrown up by the fish. You have to believe all that stuff. And you have to believe the things about me, Jesus says. If you don't believe the things about me, then you cannot read the signs of the times because I am the sign of the time. And that's what Jesus is saying. He says, they're tr you're trying to test me with a sign from heaven. I'm not going to give you one. The immediate demand of the Jewish leaders for a sign from heaven contrasts those sharply with how the Gentiles, the Gentiles um, looked at Jesus. Look at, look at back verse 1531. Go to chapter 1531 and listen to what it says here. It says, the people were amazed when they saw the mute speaking, the cripple made well, the lame walking and the blind seeing, and they praised the God of Israel. So the Gentiles were absolutely willing to believe in Jesus Christ, but the Jews wanted more and more and more. And Jesus is saying, listen, I want you to understand that I am the sign of the time. You need to, you need to believe in me. He calls them hypocrites. He says, you can discern the weather, but, you, but you're supposed to be the, the religious teachers for Israel and you don't even know when the Messiah is in front of you. And so that's why he calls them hypocrites. And then, so then he goes on and so after, and then he gets upset. He just leaves. He doesn't talk with them anymore. He walks away. Now, I don't, I don't know if he's upset in the same kind of way that you and I would be upset about those kinds of things. But he, it says Jesus then left them and went away. He wasn't going to spend any more time with them. He wasn't going to give them anything else. He, he wasn't going to give them a sign from heaven. He was because look, this is what happens. You can have miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle, and you still won't believe in Jesus if you're not going to believe in Jesus. That's what I think Jesus is telling us. You know, sometimes we believe that if Jesus would come and do these miraculous things, <laughs> if he would come to our church and, and show up and people would get healed, many people would get saved. But, but, you know, we have had healings in our church. We've had miraculous healings in our church. We've had God do amazing things with, with David Martinez. And we've had God do amazing things with, with Niall. And we've had God do amazing things with, with other people in our church. Um, and and um, just wonderful things. And we have told those things to people. But, but those things don't seem to draw people in a salvation way. So what draws people in a salvation way? The Holy Spirit. And what we want is we want people not to look at signs, but to understand who Jesus is. That's what we want. That's what we want in our own life. Because when we understand who Jesus is, then we begin to live a certain way because of our understanding of who he is and what he is in our life. Jesus goes on to help us to understand that. He goes, and in, in, this is in verse five. It says, when they went across the lake, the disciples forgot to take bread. Now, look, <laughs> I know that Jesus knows how to feed people because we just read earlier in a couple of chapters earlier and in the last chapter, chapter 15, we just read that Jesus fed 5,000 and he, read, he fed 4,000 and he fed them with small amounts. And Jesus will recount that here. Look, memory is a very interesting thing, isn't it? We can have these incredible experiences. We can have an amazing experience with Jesus. We can, ha we can have <laughs> these wonderful things happen with us. And we, we soon forget them when, <laughs> when they're not in front of us anymore. And, what, and Jesus is going to address that a little bit. Watch this. He says, when they went across, when they is the, the disciples, um, <clears throat> he says, when they went across the lake, the disciples forgot to take bread. Be careful, Jesus said to them. Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Well, they thought Jesus was talking about physical bread. What Jesus is talking about is he's talking about what happens with the theology of the Pharisees and Sadducees, what they believe about God. And he says, you have to be careful not to let their yeast infect you. So why was yeast such a bad thing? Why, why was that such a difficult thing? I, I lost it again in here. I was going to read you something. Oh, it doesn't matter. Um, 
Yeast was a difficult thing in the in the in the old in in the Old Testament and the New Testament for the Jews, because yeast was yeast was uh, compared to sin, and it was compared to sin because yeast was was kind of a secret thing. <laughs> you you put yeast, which was a fermented yeast, you put yeast in a bread, and it kind of slowly works its way through the entire loaf, and it raises it rises in the loaf. So it's secret. It's it's it works its way through everything. It kind of a, affects everything, and so that's the way sin would work. And so the Pharisees and Sadducees would equate yeast with sin, and so what would happen here? is this yeast <laughs> would get into the whole lump and then and the whole loaf, excuse me, and then it would affect everything. And what would they, they would do when they were making bread is they would take a piece of that loaf out of the bread and then set it aside. And that would be the yeast they would use for the next loaf of bread when they were ready to make bread. And so he says, be careful. He said, the teachings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees are like that yeast they will slowly and secretly begin to work their way through what you believe. And as they work their way through what you believe, this is what's going to happen. It's going to affect your life in a very negative way. So be careful about that. He wasn't talking at all about bread. Now watch, I'll show you this, verse 7. They discussed this among themselves. What did they discuss themselves? That they forgot bread <laughs> and said, it is because we didn't bring any bread. That's why he's talking about the yeast, because we didn't bring any bread. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked, you of little faith, why are you thinking among yourselves about having no bread? He's saying, don't you understand? I'm not talking about bread. I'm talking about the theology, the way that the Sadducees and Pharisees, I'm talking about their theology. I'm talking about the way they speak about God and what they understand and what they don't understand. And I'm talking about the way that their heresy pollutes everything else that's going to happen. And I'm saying to you, you better be careful not to believe that. Because when you believe it, when you believe it, it will secretly go through your entire understanding. And isn't it like this? Isn't it like that when we sin, um, that sin kind of that sin kind of destroys who we are as people? I've told this story before, but I, I thought of that when I read this. It was, it was the story when we used to pass out we used to pass out tracks in front of in front of um, some pretty bad places downtown in in Denver on Larimer Street in Denver, and we used to pass out tracks, and we would get threatened, and the police would even come and park on the other side of the street. Be, and just watch us passing out these tracks so that no one would would bother us. And when the owners of this of these these places would come out and try to hand us hundred dollar bills so that we would leave because they didn't want our influence there. And, but we we wouldn't take their money. We'd just keep passing out tracks. And there was a young girl that was going into one of these places, and she looked very. She looked like she just came off the farm from Iowa or something like that, right? She looked very innocent. And we talked to her. There was a group of us there passing out tracks that night. And she came and we asked her why she was there. And she said, well, her husband had just passed away and she had three kids and she, they didn't have any insurance and she had to do something to make money. And she decided she could make more money doing this than working her day job, which was at the bank. And we told her that we would help her. We told her that our church would take care of her and help her and help her family. And she said, no, I, I'm not going to rely on anybody. I relied on my husband and I'm in this mess. I'm just going to do it myself. So she went into this place. And again, she was, I, she, she was just the most innocent looking person at that point. Two weeks later, we saw her again come back in there. And she came to talk to us because we didn't recognize her. She had changed so much that the sin that was in her life, it was like leaven. It kind of secretly spread through her entire life. And she wasn't even the same person after living in that environment for two weeks. And so what Jesus is saying is here, he says, you, you have little faith. Why are you talking among yourselves about having no bread? Do you still not understand? Don't, don't you remember the five loaves and the 5,000 and how many basketfuls you gathered or seven loaves and 4,000? And show and how many basketfuls you gathered. How is it you don't understand that I am not talking to you about bread, but be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Be on your guard. 
So what God is telling us today is there are a lot of people out there with words that, that aren't of him. There are a lot of people out there that are words that really don't represent him. They act like they do. They say they do. There are a lot of people out there that, that are claiming to be believers in Christ, but their theology or their philosophy of life doesn't match up with what God says, what Christ says. And you have to be careful not to let them affect your life. Because you remember, these Sadducees and Pharisees were the leaders of the religious, religious folks, the Jews. They were the leaders. And he said, even sometimes the leaders of a religious group can lead you astray. So be very, very careful to watch what you believe. It's not just the blatant sin of the world that can catch you. It's, it's the sin of a heresy that could come into your life and really move you in the wrong direction. And pretty soon, like that leaven, you have listened to everything they've said and, and you've begin to buy into what they buy into and you've begin to walk away from your faith in Christ. You see, the Sadducees didn't even believe it. They didn't believe in a resurrection. And Jesus knew, for example, this is one of the things that Jesus was warning them against. Jesus knew that he had to die and, re and, be, ro and be raised from the dead. He had to have a resurrection. And he told them that when he told them about the signs of Jonah, that there would be a resurrection. And, he, he, and if they didn't believe in that, then how then could these people, how then could the Sadducees, if they didn't believe in the resurrection and the, and the disciples started to believe what the Sadducees believed, then how then could they believe in Christ? That's what he's saying to them. Be very careful. It's, it's like in the 70s. I remember, you know, right now people are asking a lot of questions. One of the questions they're asking is they're saying, okay, <laughs> is this the end times? Is this the end times? Well, I don't know if it is or not. It, it might be. Who knows? Uh, I, I'm, I haven't been able to, to discern in when the end times would be, but I don't think it is. I think there's some other things that need to happen. But he's saying, look, if this is the end times, he's saying to them, and this is the time of the, of the, first, the first coming of the Messiah, you have to read the signs of the times to understand that. And if this is the end times now that we're living in, people ask that all the time, then we have to understand what that looks like. And in the 70s, what I was going to tell you, in the 70s, there was a group of people that they just believed with all their heart and they believed a guy who was leading them. And there were, there were hundreds, thousands of them maybe that they believed this guy and this guy was telling them that Jesus was coming. I think it was in the 19, early 70s. I don't know, so I'll say 72, I'm not sure. But anyway, Jesus was coming and they were supposed to sell everything they had and, and give everything to, to this guy and his ministry. And they were going to go to a field in California. And that's where they were supposed to stay and wait and meet Jesus because he was coming to that place. This guy had, had figured this whole thing out. Well, doesn't the Bible say that no one knows the time or day of his return? That Bible does say that. So, but anyway, all these people and some friends of mine did that. Some friends of mine sold everything they had, a married couple, young married couple, sold everything they had, sold their, they had a home, they sold it all. They gave all their, because they really believed in this guy. No, and no matter what people could tell them, they wouldn't believe anyone but this gentleman. So they sold everything, they gave it to this ministry, and they all went in this field. They all went in this field, and they waited and waited and waited and waited. Nothing happened, and they lost everything. We know Jesus didn't come back in the early 70s. And, and, and they lost everything. And to this day, I mean, how many years is that now? To this day, they are still, still suffering from financial devastation because they couldn't get past that loss. Look, Jesus is saying to us, be careful what you believe. Be careful what comes your way. Be careful to to understand that Jesus has compassion on you and he wants to take care of you. And he wants you to understand the truth and he wants you to live the truth because the truth will set you free. Be careful for that. Verse 12, then they understood that he was not telling them to guard against the yeast used in bread, but against the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. So be careful who you listen to. That's what it's saying. And be careful who you listen to about Jesus and who Jesus is. And I said we're going to try to get to 21, and there's a reason. I want to show you this as we go. How much time do we have? Okay. Verse 13 says, 
<clears throat> when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples. Now, this is important here. He asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? So they went, first of all, to Caesarea Philippi, which was, which was a non-Jewish community, uh, region of the country. And I think Jesus went there because he wouldn't be bothered by um, the Pharisees and Sadducees if he went there because they wouldn't follow him there. They, would, they wouldn't go that deep into enemy country, right, into the, into the non-Jewish communities. So when he went there, because most of the people there were non-Jewish, I think he felt like he, he knew that he could be left alone to teach his disciples. And the reason, I'll show you why in a minute I believe that. But watch this, verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. So he's saying, okay, who do people say that I am, the Son of Man? And he said, the first one is some say John the Baptist. We know that John the Baptist was beheaded, but maybe somehow you are the true John the Baptist. Well, what did John the Baptist do? Why did people believe that Jesus was John the Baptist? Because John the Baptist, if you remember what his message was, his message was a national repentance. And, and they, were, they were looking, again, for the signs of the times. And the signs of the time would be there would be a national repentance. And, and the true Messiah would come from the nation Israel. He would destroy the political realm. That's why they were looking for a sign from heaven to destroy the political realm. They would come and they would destroy the, the current day politics and set up an earthly kingdom, an earthly kingdom of righteousness. And John the Baptist was preaching national repentance. He was preaching for the nation of Israel to repent. So that, so, and everybody thought that when John the Baptist came and he began to preach that national repentance, then people would begin to, 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 to do what they were supposed to do in, in the sight of God. And God would bless them by overtaking the political, the political uh, conversation of their day and that he would set up his earthly kingdom. So some people said that he was John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Well, why Elijah? Well, because Elijah was a doer of miracles, if you'll look in the Old Testament. He did a lot of miracles. He, there was a lot of miraculous things that happened in his life. And so since Jesus was doing all these miracles, I mean, for goodness sakes, we just talked about some of them. He came down and healed the leper from the Sermon on the Mount. He cast out demons. We've gone over this and over this. He's, he's, he's done all these miracles, fed 5,000, and at another time, fed 4,000 with basketfuls of food left over each time. And so they say he's Elijah. Why? Because he's a doer of miracles. And they've watched Jesus do miracles. And so they said, ah, that must be who this is. Elijah's come back. And that's who he is. And he's doing all these miracles. And still others, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Why Jeremiah? Because Jeremiah was a prophet. He spoke for God. And remember when Jesus came off the mountain? Remember what they said? This man speaks with such authority, teaches with such authority. Because he spoke for God. And and people would worship him, and he wouldn't say that he wasn't God. And so they thought, okay, this must be uh, the prophet who speaks for God. So that's, what, that's the conversation that was going around. He was one who was preaching national repentance, or he was one who does miracles, or he was one who spoke for God. So they gave him respect, and they gave him honor, they gave him a position, a place of respect and honor, but they didn't go far enough. And that's what Jesus wants you to understand from the very beginning to this chapter 15 so far, from when the Pharisees and Sadducees came to trick him, bring us a sign from heaven. And he says, you don't, you don't even know who I am. And from the symbol of yeast, don't listen to their teaching, because if you listen to their teaching, you won't believe in who I am because they don't believe in who I am. They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? And Simon Peter, as the leader of the disciples, spoke up, you are the Christ. Now there's two things that, that Simon Peter says that Jesus is. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. You are the Messiah. You're the Christ, the Messiah. You're the one who came to save the world of its sin. But you're not just 
sent from God. You are the son of the living God. Now, in Caesarea Philippi, there were all these all these other deities. There was a host of a plethora of deities, a plethora of God's little G that people worshipped in in this part of the country, in the Greek philosophical understanding and in other understandings. There were all of these gods. So Simon, but they weren't living. They were made out of stone and they were made out of brick and they were made out of wood and silver and whatever, right? So Simon Peter gets it right. And that's what we have to do today. We have to get it right. We have to really understand this. Look, Simon Peter asks, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. That's who you are. You are the one who comes to forgive the world of his sins. And you are God himself. And because Simon Peter gets it right, Jesus gives him this great, wonderful understanding. This, this kind of like this big spiritual hug. <laughs> he, he, he says, you're right, Simon, you got it right. And because Jesus is the Christ and because Jesus is God himself and be, because he's always faithful and because he's always truthful, because there's no life found in him, because everything he does, everything he does is, is a representation of the father on earth. He says, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. Because of all of that, Simon Peter got it. He finally got it. Well, what was the thing that helped Simon Peter to get it? You remember when Simon Peter was walking on the water and he began to sink when Jesus called him out of the boat? And, and then at that moment, he says, he must be God. He must be the living son of God. So <laughs> this is the first time the church is mentioned in the Bible. It says, Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by men, but by my Father in heaven. So how are you going to know the real revelation of Jesus? How are you going to know who he really is? You're going to know who he really is because the Father in heaven is going to reveal him to you. Now, I'm not going to share much more because I want to finish with this. We'll pick up on this tomorrow as we, as we go with Billy tomorrow. But let me finish with this illustration. Uh Someone who is a barber, he, he said, you don't have to mention my name, but we all know who our barber is. So <laughs> someone who was a barber had someone in his chair and there was only, there's only one person allowed at a time in his barber shop. That's what he does. And he's masked up and he sanitizes the whole thing, this whole shop before a new person comes in. And there was a person in the chair and, and this person was asking David about, oops, I mentioned his name. Sorry. This person was asking our barber <laughs> about, uh, about relationships. And so David, I'll just use his name. David was um, telling him about what God says about relationships in the Bible. And as he was talking to this person, another person came the next haircut and he was sitting outside and, and the Holy Spirit spoke to David and said, you know what? I want you to go and I want you to bring that person because it's usually only one person at a time in the shop. I want you to bring that person to the shop while you're finishing with this guy and talking to him about relationships. And I want you to set him at a distance, you know, do all the stuff you're supposed to do, but just let him sit in the shop and it, because it's cooler in here and because I want him to hear what you're saying. So David excused himself from his haircut, wasn't finished yet, excused himself from his haircut and went out and got the guy and brought him into the shop. And, and, <laughs> he then he finished the haircut. He finished telling this this person, I don't know, young man, I guess, I don't know, he finished telling this person about Jesus and about relationships and about godly relationships and those kinds of things. And then the, the guy left and the new guy who was sitting in the shop got into the chair and said to David, boy, I really needed that. I really needed what you had to say to that guy. He said, I'm sorry for eavesdropping, but I really needed that. And David said, okay, didn't pursue it, didn't ask any questions. And so, you know, as, as, you're, as you do when you're in a barber chair, you begin to talk about other things. They talked about koi fish and ponds. And David just built this really beautiful pond in his yard. And so after the haircut was done, they walked outside to look at the, the, the fish and to look at the pond. And they're out in the backyard looking at the stuff. And the guy brings it up again. And he says, I really needed to hear that. And <laughs> the guy finishes. David didn't ask any questions. The guy just finished. He says, listen, I got to tell you this. He said, I was online looking at stuff I shouldn't have been looking at, and I had made an arrangement 
to get my haircut. And then after the haircut, I was get my haircut with you. And after this haircut, I was going to go to a place and meet a person and cheat on my wife. I've never done that before, but at all, it was, it's all arranged. That's where I'm supposed to go now, right now. And he said, but after listening to what you said to him, he said, I'm not going and I'm going to go home and I'm going to love my wife. Wow. <laughs> you see, look, Jesus cares about every aspect of your life. And you know he is the Messiah, one to come to take away the sins of the world. But you also know that he is the living God. And as the living God, he cares about you. He's not a God of stone. He's not a God of silver or gold. He's not a God made out of a rock or a piece of wood. Jesus is the living God. And because he is the living God, he cares about everything that happens in your life. And he's going to send somebody in your path or in the path of someone you love to take care of them. The Bible says for every sin, he will provide a way of escape. Now, not everyone is dramatic as that, <laughs> but he still does it. And he has compassion on you. Remember when John, his friend, John the Baptist, was beheaded, the first thing he did was go out and heal people because he had compassion on them. You remember, he had taught them for three days, and there were 4,000 people plus women and children, and he was worried. He had compassion on them. He was worried that they would. he was forgiving their sins, and he was healing their bodies, and he was teaching them for three days, and, and, and he was worried that they wouldn't make it home, and he had compassion on them. Look, that's who Jesus is. Jesus is a God of compassion and he is the Messiah, the one to come to take away the sins of the world. But he is also a living God who loves you and cares about you and wants to do some great things in your life. You just have to let him. If you're going through a difficult time, don't give up. Don't stop. Don't let God do his finished work in you. Let him send someone to you to speak to you about the things that need to be spoken about. Let him finish the miracle in your life. Let him be the living God for you. Listen, you're his favorite. I'm so grateful to be able to share this lesson with you today out of the 16th chapter of Matthew. God bless you. We really love you. Billy, are you still there? Yes, I'm still here. <laughs> there he is. Good, Good message. Thank you. Look, this is the Bible is so full of wonderful truths, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Yeah, it is just gets to our life and takes care of us. Do you want to pray us out, Billy? Because then we'll have a few minutes to wait for Brian. Yes, sure. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, just thank you for this message. Um, <laughs> you know, we thank you how um, you make it very, very clear who you are and uh, that we're supposed to stay away from the philosophies of the world. And it's easy, it's easy to get caught up even in our personal relationships or in uh, you know, believing that this will work or that will work, this magic pill or that. And um, you are Lord, Lord, you are God. And uh, that's the only uh, place we can be. Help us to see that and to put aside every other thing and, and not to eat the leaven of, uh, of the world, but, and, and even get in a little bit of that, like a little bit of sin. But Lord, to stay uh, with our eyes on the prize, focused on you, and, um, and watch you do and you're a God who's worthy to be served. You, you are, like Rick says, very compassionate and you love us. And so, Lord, we want to believe the truth only. We want to have a pure and holy uh, belief. And, and that's in your word. And I thank you for Rick for um, dividing the word, uh, which is pure and holy and is food for our, for our souls, for our very spirit wants that, Lord. So thank you for that today. And as Brian uh, sings worship songs, I pray that... Um, we'd be able to worship you in spirit and truth, which is the only way you want to be worshiped. So again, I just thank you for your word. Thank you for Rick for uh, dividing it so well. And I pray that um, like that person in the barbershop, we would hear thing, we would hear this and it would turn us away from maybe the things we're going to do, or maybe the things we think satisfy. We turn back to you, Lord. We'd have, we'd be refocused on you. And uh, I just pray these things in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, everybody. God bless you. I'm so excited to be able to bring the word to you today. And Billy and I will be with you tomorrow at 10 o'clock uh, on Facebook Live. Or you can see it later if you want to look at it later. And he'll post it up on, on uh, 
on YouTube. <laughs> Although not from my car here. That'll be not a while. Car, yeah. It'll get posted, yeah. <laughs> All, All right. right. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow.